It's a little strange um, flying this morning from Israel. Um, <laughs> and uh, coming to Los Angeles to speak about justice and righteousness. And um, one of the issues that we need to talk about, and today we're it's Sunday morning, so we get to talk with each other. Let's talk about justice and righteousness. Let's talk about how we feel about justice and righteousness. Let's talk about how justice and righteousness is being used against us and some of our ambivalence about justice and righteousness. Let's talk about in Israeli society, and in fact, very often, I can't speak of you um, per se, but a Jewish community which is increasingly ambivalent about a conversation about justice and righteousness as if somehow justice and righteousness is the domain of the Palestinian. And we, we have to talk about how to survive. Because when Israel is attacked, it's attacked that it's not living up to the standards of justice and righteousness. It's with great frustration. And truthfully, we don't really understand it. When we read headlines about Palestinian teenager killed, we have failed to live up to the standard of justice. We killed a Palestinian teenager. The fact that the Palestinian teenager was stabbing somebody is not in the headlines. And so we become kind of weary, as if Israel is about a country where Jews could survive, and the Palestinians are laying claim to the category of justice and righteousness. And so we don't talk about it as much. We don't talk about it in Israel as much. We don't talk about it even amongst ourselves as much. And one of the reasons why we chose this title and we chose this theme is that we must talk about it and we could never, as Jews, allow somebody to take away from us our core categories which define who we are as a people. We lose far more, we lose far more when we alienate ourselves from categories which are essential to who we are. And when we become so defensive that we lose our ability to even engage in serious moral conversations. See, I know it's not politically correct, but coming from Israel, I don't like tikkun olam. makes me uncomfortable. I don't even know how to fix my neighborhood, let alone fix the world. My neighborhood stinks. I don't know how to walk in the streets in my neighborhood. Repair the world? It's just so far from me. It's so alien to anything that I think about. Right now, if you want an interesting experience, it's like, it's, it's an interesting one. I, 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 I don't wish it on anybody. See, the problem with people who stab you is that you don't hear them coming. You don't hear them coming. There is no noise beforehand. Usually, when it comes to stabbing, they could stab the first person they want to stab. They can. The question is, what will the second person do? And as some of you know, I wrote in the Times of Israel a, few, uh, a week or so ago, um, there are times in the life cycle of Israel 
where I carry my gun. Usually it stays in my safe uh, for 37 years. But from time to time, when it's like you know things aren't right, I feel I have to carry my gun to protect myself and to protect those around me. But how do you wheel a carriage? I was pushing my granddaughter to her gun. She's 14 months. But you see, if you put two hands on the carriage, you can't draw your gun quick enough. It's an interesting question. And don't worry, I'm no, it's not speed. It's nothing to do with, you know, like I know in the way. But it's like if you're holding here, you're worried because it's a matter of seconds. So do you know what it's like putting your gun in a carriage? You put it away, it's not pointed, and guns, again, I'm not getting into your conversation here about guns because that has nothing to do with our conversation in America, in Israel. We don't feel we have an inalienable right to carry guns and guns aren't there to protect us from some, from some tyrannical government. It's not my, it's, it's, it's a completely different language. But what do you do, because you have two hands on a carriage and you want to know that you can get to it quickly. And this is the experience that you're going through. And it's, it's, it's a bizarre one. And in that environment, you're thinking about primarily, how do I sort of just get through the day? The last thing you're thinking about is tikkun olam. You don't even know anymore how to fix your neighborhood. I can't fix my neighbor. I'd love to fix it. But there's nobody in the political horizon in Israel who claims that they have a solution to fixing our neighbor. Now, each one of us has various political positions which you did not come here to hear about. And I won't bore you with them. But we have different political positions with regard to what might make it worse. And we might prefer a certain politician who we think might make it worse less. And we, might <laughs> and we might not like this politician because we think he or she is making it much, much worse quickly. But fixing it? Fixing it? For most Israelis, it's silly. And it's interesting, in the last election, there's not one single Israeli party Israeli Zionist party, with the exception of Meretz, which spoke at all about a foreign policy. It wasn't even, imagine being in Israel and running for prime minister and not putting forth or talking about what your foreign policy is. Because Israelis sort of feel that's not on the table right now. So what do you do when forget tikkun olam, forget even tikkun your neighborhood, you can't even fix your streets. So what do you do? You can get angry. You could become people who look for vengeance. As a Jew, I know a different way. And that's what I'd like to talk to you about this morning. I'd like to talk to you about how we fix ourselves. Who do I want to be? Could I always be that person? No. Could I always achieve the goals and aspirations and expectations that I have for myself? No. I fail all the time. All human beings fail. But what characterizes us is that we talk about who we want to be. And we don't let somebody else define and control a category. Who do I want to be? What does it mean to be a just person today? How am I as an Israeli, how do I as an Israeli live up to the moral expectations and demands that I believe I and my tradition place upon me in the midst of the worst environment. God bless you.
Your, your coffee reminds me, my mother, God bless her, she's 82 years old, she was just at a concert, and she started to cough. And like everybody got angry at her. Like this, she said, what do you expect? Like as if I'm like coughing because it's, anyway, shh, shh. <laughs> coughing, like, what am I supposed to do? I'm like, yeah, I really just wanted a room to <laughs> cough. <laughs> anyway, God bless you, cough away. <laughs> uh, if you want some water, I have water actually. <laughs> Would you, you're okay? Yeah, yeah good. <laughs> it's, talking about justice is very cathartic for me. Talking about justice is the only way I know how to be sane in a crazy world. And when I see the craziest, the truly craziest headlines, and I keep on worry, hearing the, the allegedly, you know, the allegedly, the allegedly, the allegedly, I look at it. And it is so easy for my soul to become cold. It's so easy for my soul to become hard and to just turn away and to say bleep to all of you, not you. But instead, what we do is we talk about justice. So let's talk about who we want to be. Let's talk about who we would like to be if it would be possible for us to be such people. Let's talk about who we would like to be and maybe what are the small steps that we, can, that we could activate in order to get closer, even though it's very, very difficult in certain realities to concentrate and to put major effort on these issues. When your primary issue is not the other person's rights, but your rights. What is justice? Justice is at its core an obligation. Justice at its core means to recognize that there is another who obligates you. Charity is to be moved to be magnanimous. Charity is supererogatory, is to go beyond the requirements. You could feel very, very proud of yourself when you're charitable. You don't feel proud of yourself when you do justice. Because that's what is expected of you. To treat another justly is to see them, to feel obligated by them, to recognize that they have inalienable rights, that they have X, Y, or Z, which is theirs, and it, you are obligated to enable them. You are obligated to empower them. You are obligated to allow that which is their rights, their just desert, to inherit their life and to be part of them. When you walk in the world and you recognize that you share the public domain, we walk together. The fundamental, my inalienable right, unlike Hobbes, my inalienable right is not merely to survive and to do all that is necessary for my, for my survival. And that, the, and that the core, Hobbes argues, that the core condition of reality, of existence, is really the war of all against all. And that I might ultimately come up with another modus operandi of, 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 in which we divide the public sphere because if I give you, you'll give me, and if there is some level of peace and coexistence, I have a greater chance to achieve my inalienable right, and that is to survive. In our tradition, your survival, your rights are only part of the story. All human beings are created in the image of God and consequently the people with whom we inhabit this world obligate us. And the antithesis of justice is Cain who says, when God says, where is your brother? And what does Cain say? 
Hashomer Achi Anochi, Amaya, my brother's keeper. And with that, the Torah teaches one of the core fundamental lessons of Judaism and one of the core fundamental lessons of justice. You are your brother's keeper. Others obligate you. Now, what mitigates that sense of obligation? What makes it so difficult? What makes it so not self-evident in our lives? The first is that just as another has rights, so do I. If all people are created in the image of God, guess who else is created in the image of God? Me! I'm here too! I, justice is also what I deserve. Justice is also what my inalienable rights are. And unfortunately, as we walk in the public sphere, very often our rights compete. And when we are in conflict or we're in war, it's very difficult to think about another's rights when the immediacy of yours is so central to your consciousness. People who face this dilemma the most are soldiers. And the whole discipline of morality of war is a discipline which trains soldiers to recognize that even though they have an inalienable right and that justice demands that they live, there are ground rules, things they're allowed to do and things they're not allowed to do in the pursuit of their lives. You can't defend your life at all costs. That is one of the fundamental core principles of morality of war. And one of the core principles that Israel instills in every one of our soldiers is how do you fight a just war justly? And there's nothing, there's no example of me or you which is, which is like, it's more stark than a battlefield. And the reality that we live in is very often now our public streets are our battlefield. Does my concern for myself exhaust my consciousness and my horizon? The second is what happens when the other who has inalienable rights acts in such a despicable, de deplorable way? To see and to feel compelled by someone else's rights, I have to identify in some measure with them. So our Torah teaches us that all people are created in the image of God. Okay, I understand. All people are, but you, you're an SO. You? Why should I care about you? Why should I care about a society which ennobles murderers? Why should I care about people who want to kill me? So it's not merely competing rights. It's the fact that you aren't necessarily a person who I'm even motivated to want to even see, to who I want to care about. Your rights aren't my concern because you haven't earned the right for me to care about your rights. And third, as conflicts increasingly become religious, and as we leave the domain of the, tw the 20th century secular conflicts, the conflicts of nationalisms and various isms, the communism. And our conflicts increasingly become religious. Very often, God, God's self, becomes an avenue or a motivation for moral blindness. Because why should I care about you if you're not loved by God the same way that I am? And one of the great tragedies of monotheism is that we believe that if there's one God, that God must love one person or one group best. And as we are motivated by our religious ideologies, and every one of us, religious ideologies over and over again, 
instead of pushing for justice, undermine justice. Because I have to be just to us. And us is not merely my small group. Us are those whom God loves better. And consequently, in the name of God, I am allowed to perpetrate any injustice on others without feeling that it's injustice because you aren't somebody whom God loves. And the ability of people motivated by religious language, motivated by religious language, to stop caring about principles of justice is one of the great tragedies of monotheism. And it's what I wrote this book on putting God second, how to save religion from itself. It's what that book is about, trying to analyze that and to think about that question. Why is it? Why is it that it is rabbis in Israel who say that anybody who raises a knife should be killed? Now, nobody is talking. The conversation is not about what you need to do in order to defend yourself. That's not the conversation. The conversation is after they're neutralized, what should you do? That is the only debate. In Israel, there is no, nobody's being pacifist. And no, that's not even anybody's issue. And everybody knows that we don't know if a person has a bomb strapped on. You have to do whatever you need to do. In the, in the minute of danger, you have to do what you need to do. But why is it that it is a religious, that it is religious leaders who engage in the conversation after they've been neutralized? Should the mob kill people or not? Why, would a, why is that a religious language? Now, I could talk to you about what religious figures say in Islam. But that, that's not relevant. That's not our conversation here today. We're talking about ourselves. Because when you are chosen, there's, out, there's us and there's them, and justice only applies to us. In the context of Israel, and very often in the context of all conflicts, justice is a very di is difficult to speak about. You seem to be, and again, I don't know, um, I grew up in a world in which if you were liberal, that was a compliment. <laughs> um, so I apologize if I'm insulting anybody here, but I'm not, and again, I'm not talking about American politics. But liberal democracy is about recognizing that people have fundamental liberties, fundamental rights. But when you talk about justice, somehow your left-wing flower children who think that if you just smile, the whole world will be nice. That's stupidity. Well, let's talk. And I'm not talking to you right now. I'm talking to you, but I'm talking to me. Because when I talk about this, my world becomes clearer. The chaos becomes a little smaller. And what I have to do and how I have to act has a little more direction. Israel is not simply a debate as to whether President Obama is pro-Israel or anti-Israel. Who will be better for Israel, this president or that president? Which organization more represents love of Israel? APAC, J Street, or whatever. Is my organization Zionist? Is my organization right on Israel or wrong on Israel? Israel is about a world of ideas that we care about. It's not just about foreign policy. It's about who we want to be. justice and righteousness. 
There are five core principles that I want to share with you today about the way our tradition speaks about justice and righteousness. Each one of them has implications on how Israel and how the Jewish people should conduct our foreign policy. But the implications aren't exhausted or limited to one political position. They are actually implications which apply to everyone, whether you are left-wing or right-wing, whether you feel that Buzi Herzog should be prime minister or whether you're very happy that Bibi Netanyahu was prime minister. Justice and righteousness transcends politics. Jewish values transcend politics. And each one of us, regardless of where we are, has to ask ourselves, how do these ideas obligate me? The first, and, and, and I believe that, does everybody have on the table, uh, uh, with them, Genesis 18? You all have it? Let's go back and read. I picked one source, a source that we all know unbelievably well. It's the first time that justice and righteousness are mentioned in our tradition. This is when justice and righteousness enter into our story. The first starts in verse 19. When God says, shall I hide from Abraham that I'm about to destroy the city of Zdom, God says, I can't, for I have singled him out that he may instruct his children and his posterity to keep, of, to keep the way of the Lord by doing what is just and right, in order that the Lord may bring about for Abraham what he has promised him. Genesis 18 is very, very clear. Genesis 18 gives every single one of us our marching orders. Genesis 18 states that we are chosen and that a condition of our election, that a condition of the covenant between God and the Jewish people is founded on a simple principle. I have picked you, I have singled you out, I have determined to have a covenant with you, Abraham, because I know that you are going to walk in the way of the Lord. Not walk in the way of the Lord by keeping kosher, not by walking the way of the Lord by keeping Shabbat, not by walking the way of the Lord by bowing down and bringing I don't know how many ox and goats and I don't know, and doves at the temple because you are going to walk in the way of the Lord by doing what is just and right. That means that to be a Jew, and it's very, very hard to find verses like these in the Bible. When you have 613 commandments, to be a Jew means to be busy. <laughs> right? It's like, just do stuff. What? Anything you can do is Jewish. It's like no matter what you do, from the food you eat, to where you walk, to what you, it's like we got you covered from morning till night. Our tradition speaks about the fact that every Jew has to say a hundred blessings a day. It's like every second I'm busy. It's like, it's truly, it's exhausting. It's an exhausting religion. And it really is, it's an exhausting religion and it's one of the reasons why it's so difficult. It's like what's more important, what's less important, it's really hard. And our tradition really doesn't like to say what's more important or less important. It just wants you to be busy. <laughs> but there are moments, very few, probably on one hand, where whether in the Bible or in the rabbinic tradition, you can find something that you can pick out and where the rabbis say, this is more important. This is something special. And here God says, I pick you because I know that justice and righteousness is going to define you. And that means any Jewish conversation in which justice and righteousness is not an integral part of it is not a Jewish conversation. Principle number one. And that means, if we go into the core ideologies of Zionism, that means Israel is not merely a state 
whose aim it is to enable Jewish survival, for Israel to be the homeland of the Jewish people, it must be a country which thinks at its core, what does justice and righteous require of me? And when the Pope gets up and says, if you want to be a Catholic, if you want to claim that you are a believer, that you are part of my religious community, every single person in Europe has to adopt a refugee. You have to bring them into your home. And the response of leadership in the State of Israel is, well, we can't take any. Is that a community which says, we are defined that the purpose of Israel is to survive as a just and righteous community? And again, I, I was once on a radio state channel and uh, on, on an interview, and, and a person said to me, Israel now has 50,000 refugees or people who technically the legal definition is they are seeking work permits. Israel's a signee on the International Charter for Refugees. But we refuse to accept that any of them are refugees because if they're refugees, under that charter you're not allowed to send somebody back to the country if that country where they, with, with, which they ran away from um, endangers their life. Israel has so far recognized one person as a refugee. One. There, by the way, are 60 million refugees today in the world. Our share of refugees is 50,000. Potential. How many Jews are there in the state of Israel? Six, about six and a half. How many non-Jews live in the state of Israel? Citizens. Arabs and Christians, Muslims and Christians? About a million and a half. Six and a half to a million and a half. Within the borders of the state of Israel as defined by all Israeli parties, there is no demographic problem in the state of Israel anymore. Birth rate between Jews and Arabs is almost identical. Between Israelis and, between Jews and Arabs, excuse me, citizens. 50,000. The person in the radio station asks me, says, but Israel has to be a Jewish state. This was what was mentioned by the Israeli people. I said, absolutely. Israel's the homeland of the Jewish people. I'm not arguing about that. I asked him, could we accept one refugee? He looked at me and he said, I, don't, I said, I asked, will one threaten the Jewishness of the state of Israel? He didn't like it because he's used to interviewing people. He didn't like what the interview was like. I said, so he said, yeah, we could, one. I said, what about a hundred? A hundred. We could do a hundred. I said, what about a thousand? He's quiet. I said, remember, six and a half million, a million and a half. A million and a half, well, this, is the Jewishness of the state of Israel going to fall apart? He says, we can take a thousand. So I said, five thousand. And he said, thought for a moment, he said, five thousand, bezehu. And that's it. Five thousand and one is on a helicopter and they're gone. I said, great, we agree. Now we're just arguing about numbers. Let's talk objectively, what's the number? Could Israel in the international crisis speak about two and a half thousand people a year? When you worry about justice, when justice and righteousness is not a luxury, when you understand that to be Jewish means, and that the definition of a Jewish state, the definition of the homeland of a Jewish people, is not merely a place where Jews are safe from anti-Semites. That is one of the goals. Not just a place where Jews could be safe and where we could protect ourselves. That's one of our goals. Not just a place where I don't have to be embarrassed about being Jew, where I could stand up and if someone wants to kill me, I could not just simply say no, but I could train and do something about it. That is one of the goals of Zionism. But the other goal of Zionism is what type of country we want to create. 
That's what Genesis 18 says. Otherwise, you don't even get out of the gate. The story doesn't even start. Every one of us, I don't care if you're right wing or left wing, how does this obligate you? And if all you say is, I can't deal with this now, then I want to tell you, as an Israeli, you have given the Palestinians their greatest victory. And it's not a public relations victory. Because you've weakened our soul. Our strength comes from our ability to live by and to hold on to our values in the most difficult times. And Genesis 18 says, if you want to be in the Jewish story, this has to be your story. One, two. Justice is not just about that which we deserve. What is this story about? God says to Abraham, shall I hide from Abraham what I'm about to do? Verse 20, then the Lord said, the outrage of Sodom and Gomorrah is so great and their sin so grave. What is Sodom and Gomorrah to Abraham? I know Lot lives there, but is Sodom and Gomorrah his? What could Abraham say? It's not my problem. It's Sodom and Gomorrah. You talking about me or you talking about them? It's not my problem. The first test as to whether Abraham will live according to the principles of justice and righteousness is whether he will choose to get involved in the issues which do not touch him personally. It's not about Jews. It's not about our community. It's about somebody else. That's the first test. God says, I can't hide from him because he's, I've chosen him because he's going to teach his children to walk in the way of the Lord by doing what is just and right. Now let me talk to you about Sodom and Gomorrah and Abraham's first response is, yes, I see them. It's a remarkable part of our story. And again, don't confuse this for tikkun olam. This is not fixing the whole world. If injustice is about to happen to somebody next to me, my solution is not. What's good for us is that they should kill each other for as long as possible. Does that sound familiar to anybody? What's good for us is that they should kill each other for as long as possible. The first test of justice and righteousness is that we recognize that justice and righteousness are not categories for Jews. That justice and righteousness applies to all human beings. And Abraham is tested, and Abraham responds, I am here. The first, you cannot start a Jewish story that Judaism at its core is a religion in which justice and righteousness has to be at the essential DNA of our existence. The second is that we apply justice and righteousness not merely to ourselves, but also to others, to others outside of our community. And the third is that justice and righteousness is not something you just talk about. God says the outrage of Sodom and Gomorrah is so great and their sins so grave. And the men in verse 22 went out from there to stone while Abraham remained standing before the Lord and Abraham came forward and said, when justice and righteousness obligate you, you have to act. It's not just about convening a group. And it's not just about a Torah study seminar. Justice, when you are committed to justice, you have to change the way you act. Abraham gets up and says to God, it is forbidden, it is a desecration for you to act in this way. 
when you are obligated by justice and righteousness, you can't be a spectator. Justice and righteousness are not spectator. It's not a spectator sport. Justice and righteousness has to change your priorities. It has to change what you do. It has to change the way you talk. It has to change the order, your schedule. Fourth, and this is one of the most difficult ones and one of the least self-evident ones. After Abraham says to God, what were you thinking? Will the judge of the whole earth not deal justly? If there are 50 people in the city, will you destroy them? Will you destroy the whole, will you destroy the 50 when you're destroying the whole city? And God says, no, I will save the city for the 50. What could have Abraham done? Whew, that was tiring. Standing up to God is emotionally exhausting. I did my part. I heard. I said my piece. One of the most remarkable dimensions of this story, often forgotten, is that it continues and continues and continues. What if there's 40? And God said, if there's 40, I'll save the city. And Abraham says, I'm but dust and ashes. What? I can't believe I'm even talking to you. What happens if there's 30? Literally, this is what it says here. And God says, I'll save it for 30. What about 20? I'll save it for 20. What about 10? I'll save it for 10. I don't want to get into why God stops at 10. And one of the reasons, Abraham stops at 10. And one of the reasons why I don't want to get into it is because I don't know the answer. <laughs> this answer, I just, I never. So we'll leave it as it's not our theme for today. One of the things about justice is that when you're obligated to act, it's not a one-time event. It's not, I cared, I did it, I'm done. Let me make that relevant. How many of us, present company, myself included, have said, I tried to do justice and righteousness to the Palestinians. I tried. Omer was going to give them 95%, and they said, no. I did my part, and they said, no. But if justice and righteousness obligate you, so what if they said no? So what? They said no, and therefore what? The story's over? Justice and righteousness can now be put in the, on, on the bookshelf. Let's say they did say no. Let's say, and it's not just let's say, we know that we are meeting a society which increasingly is moving further and further away from accepting our right to be here. And by the way, so is our society, but I'm not doing whether the... People get all worried and nervous about equivalences. Just comment. What do we do? Do we stop? Do we say, we tried and therefore the story is over? Or, what, or does what defines a Jewish foreign policy, what defines a Jewish people, is that we never stop and say no. We never stop and say, we've done enough. I'm not talking about committing suicide. I'm not talking about denying my inalienable rights under the principles of justice and righteousness. When you are compelled by it, it defines you. It's not limited to your community. It doesn't. It doesn't exhaust itself just in your, action, in your words, but demands action. And it demands action which doesn't stop. It demands that you pursue it. One of the interesting principles about justice in our tradition is tzedek tzedek tirdov. Pursue it. Run after it. If it's not there, work harder. What do you need to do to make it a little better? 
It's so easy, and I have to tell you, and here I'm speaking truly as an Israeli, it's so easy and tempting to say, we did our part. Give me a call. Give me a call when you're ready. And then make sure that we have big guns and put our police wherever we can and just shut down our hearts and shut down our souls and stop caring about them. I can't tell you how easy it is. And every time they stab, and every time another or one of them talks, and even, I'm not even getting into whether Jews should pray on the Temple Mount, but frankly, it's a dis- I, I don't think, I don't need to pray on the Temple Mount and it's just fine with me, but the conversation is disgusting. It's a disgusting conversation. Like a Jew, can, like somehow, if I pray there, all of Islam loses. It's like, grow up. It's like it's, just, it's like it's such a yeshi. It's like I hear it, it makes me aesthetically repulsive. It's an aesthetically repulsive. Again, do I need, I don't want to go up there and I don't, it's just fine, I'm just fine waiting for the Messiah. And even then, I don't even want a temple. I'd much rather come down in here. It's like here, it's like, here it's beautiful. I, I know, I'd much rather listen to Ed than, than have a high priest sacrifice a goat. <laughs> Any day of the week, it's not even close. Not even close. So, but let's say even, okay, so you have some aspiration, you have some noble story about goats and blood and whatever, you, you want to go, great, okay. But the notion that if a Jew prays there, I remember I went up to the Temple Mount many years ago, as in, we had a theology conference of Jews, Christians, and Muslims, and we were guests of the Waqf. I had two guards walking next to me throughout my visit to make sure that at no point during my visit did I utter a prayer. Frankly, when I, when I expose to that, it's nauseating. It's so easy just to shut it off and to say, I can't say these words here, um, just say, you know what. I just, ugh. I'm not worried, you, you, I should, and, and then, in that context, say, oh, what do I owe you? It is so easy to stop talking that talk. And that all we do when Jews will get together, we'll talk about Israel, we'll talk about our bad public relations. We'll talk about the anti-Semitic press. We could spend all our time doing so. And you know why we can? Because it's there. Because it's not a fantasy. Because there's no way that consistently this type of reporting is done only for us. It just sits you and it riles and it gets you angry. And you know, all of us, anytime we talk about Israel, that's what we could talk about. And every week we'll have more, more to talk about. And especially at these times, it's so easy. And Abraham teaches us, you have to pursue it. You don't stop. You don't let it go. You don't say, I did my part. Justice and righteousness is not a moment in your life. It's not a moment. It's a personality trait which comes back over and over and over. And so you know what? We offered and they said no, so offer again. Realities changed? Great, come up with a new offer. What you might have been willing to offer 10 years ago, you're not willing to offer today? That's sensible. That's not be, that's sensible. Realities change. ISIS wasn't around back then. Now we know that even no matter who we sign a treaty with, doesn't mean that that's who we're going to have to live with. Things got much more complicated than they were in the past. Much more complicated. Come up with whatever your politics is. What's the deal that you feel we could live with now? Fine. Or regardless of what it is. Is it, is it a peace treaty? Is it some permanent um, or temporary solution? Is it autonomy? I don't care what it is. Keep on feeling obligated to put forth something so that you and the state of Israel could live by the principles of justice and righteousness. And that obligates of every single Jew to also shift what they talk about when they talk about Israel. And that we can't simply talk all the time especially amongst ourselves. It's such a futile conversation. 
about how unfair they are, let's also leave some space to talk about who we want to be. And last, and with this I want to conclude. The theme of this series is justice and righteousness. God in Genesis 18, verse 19 says, they will keep the way of the Lord by doing what is just and right. There are two words, tzedek umishpat. And one of the things that all of you know is that whenever our tradition offers two words, the rabbis pounce on it and say, what do I need these two words for? What's the difference between justice and righteousness? What is justice and righteousness together? And our tradition teaches us that justice and righteousness, when do you have justice and righteousness together? When you compromise. Now compromise is a very strange term. Compromise doesn't sound like a value. It sounds like what? Like a compromise. <laughs> and philosophers speak about the, 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 the inner contradiction of this term. Because compromise is a compromise, it's not a value. Justice is about let justice pierce the mountain. Whatever somebody deserves is what they have to get regardless of the consequences. You sacrifice for justice, you're willing to die for justice. You're willing to kill for justice. When justice defines you, it is at the pyramid. It's, it's at the apex of the pyramid. Everything else is secondary. Our tradition teaches us to know that the justice that we want is a justice together with righteousness, and that is a, just, a justice together with compromise. That one of the great enemies of a moral world, a universe is the notion of perfect justice. One of the great enemies of a, uni of a moral universe is when someone is so convinced that justice is on their side that they're willing to ignore others. In their pursuit of the perfect justice, they wait. Maybe Abraham stops at 10 because he's not looking for perfect justice. Perfect justice in our world doesn't exist. It's about compromising multiple values. Your rights, other people's rights, your memories, other people's memories. Feelings, emotions, needs. Justice becomes scary. in the name of justice, you are willing to perpetrate great injustices on others. Justice, instead of motivating you to see others, could actually motivate you to be blind to them. Because all you see is not the person. All you see is the, is the concept, is the theory. We are the victims of that language. So often people say, in the name of perfect justice, we have to press a reset button and, re and, and move back to 1947. We have to destroy or undermine the state of Israel, which somehow was created in sin. That in the name of perfect justice, the only thing that we could do was wipe out the state of Israel so that we could be in some form of, a, of, a, of this original moment and that I won't give up until I get everything. I won't get up until I get everything. I was teaching a group of, of, of Christian leaders at the Institute um, a year ago in the midst of the war in Gaza. And a Latino minister who, was, who didn't have a lot of experience with the Jewish community and with Judaism and with Israel, and it, it was new to him. And he said, I, I just took, I was in a taxi in Jerusalem with a Palestinian driver, and I asked him, because here he's studying at the Institute, is peace ever going to be possible, he said. He asked the driver, and the driver says, do you have a few minutes? And he said, yes, I do. And he says, okay, come with me. And he took him for a drive. And he stops and he says, here, 
See this house? It's my house. There will be peace here when I have keys to my house. And the Latino minister turned to me and he said, and he, how do we answer? It, it makes sense, doesn't it? it was, it's his house. I can understand. What do I respond? And my response was as follows. Justice requires that I recognize that when my state was formed, whether I wanted to or not, whether I intended or not, an injustice did occur to other people. That the rebirth of Israel, and I could expand it, that our needs to survive indefensible borders have forced us to do things which we would not have chosen to do in a perfect universe. I recognize that both to Arabs who lived in Israel before the State of Israel, as well as Arabs who are still living after 67, there is an injustice which is being perpetrated. There is an injustice which they are experiencing. And I feel bad about it. I want to apologize for it. I'm willing to make restitution. I'm willing to do everything in my power, everything in my power, to mitigate and to minimize the injustice that they're experiencing. But if the only way that I could meet their demands of justice is to die. If the only way that I can meet their demand of justice is to create a greater injustice, then they've lost a partner, whether it is a partner for peace or as a partner for justice. And the Latino minister said, I understand. Because when somebody speaks in the name of perfect justice, they're not creating a better universe. Justice itself could be idolatrous. And the fantasy that you are the carrier or that you are the owner of the only pure, just claim in the conversation is so intoxicating. It's like a drug. And so the last lesson of Abraham in Genesis 18 is that we want justice and righteousness. I'm willing to be imperfect. I'm willing to not always be purely just because I also have to survive. I'm willing to not always be purely just because I also have fears. Some of them are legitimate, some are understandable, and some are not. I'm willing to be not always perfectly just because I have my story, which I'm also loyal to. The enemy of the good, the enemy of a moral universe, is a language of perfect justice. So my prayer today, and something that I hope I tried to model this morning, is that in the midst of really difficult times, really difficult times, we do whatever we need to do. We do the things we need to do to keep our children safe. We always will. We always will. Nobody's talking about not doing that. We're going to do what we need to do. And it is our job to talk about and to call forth any time there is a biasness and a, and a criticism of Israel which is unfounded and, un and illegitimate. And that our organizations and our synagogues and our institutions should be places that convene us to do precisely that. But along with doing that, we have to do this. 
And we don't have to do it once. We have to do it again and again and again. Because I'm now working on Israel for my grandchildren. I'm hoping that they're going to have a different world, a different life. It's not going to be in the next year or two or five. Maybe in 20. It's going to take really hard work. And it's not going to come by somebody flying in and saying, here, I've solved your problem, just do A, B, C, or D. But we have to every single day and over and over again talk about who we want to be. It's going to be hard to get there. But if we don't talk about it, one thing I can guarantee you is we're not going to get there. Could Israel survive without justice? Yes. Would it be Israel? No. Could the Jewish people survive without justice? Yes. Would it be Jews? No. So my bracha to all of us is that we should be Jews. My bracha to all of us is that we should have the strength of character to do what we've always done. Our history hasn't been an easy history. But we've stood by our principles. And we gave up the fantasies of a perfect world and tried to come as close as possible. And so let's talk about justice. Let's celebrate justice and righteousness as core features of who we are. And let's pray, but not only pray. Let's also act so that justice and righteousness could be great, in a more greater way be approximated and implemented Sometimes in small parts and sometimes in bigger parts in our lives. Because when we do that, we are fulfilling the blessing and the challenge of God to Abraham. For I have singled him out that he may instruct his children and his posterity to keep the way of the Lord by doing what is just and right. Thank you. here at Valley Beth Shalom, and when Messiah comes and rebuilds the temple, Dr. Hartman will be here at VBS. <laughs> I want that recorded. Uh, it's a pleasure to have you here. It's always a pleasure to learn with you. Um, I want to say just a moment of special welcome to the rabbis, cantors, and teachers who are all here, which is about half of this audience, so to all of you. And uh, for those of you who are not a rabbi, um, the lecture you heard today, you're going to hear this coming Shabbos in Shul. Yeah. So uh, destroy your notes. It's a really a pleasure always to learn with you and to, uh, to share your thoughts. Um, my job is to uh, first ask you to pass up all the question cards, pass them to the aisle, and the wonderful people from the Hartman Institute will pick them up and we'll organize them so that your questions can be asked. And I'll begin with one question. And then that'll give us a chance to sort of organize these parts. Um, as you probably know, while you are suffering through the um, agonies of this moment in Israel, um, the Jewish community of North America has suffered through its own agony over the course of the summer and the early fall as the Iran uh, deal was being negotiated. And the, uh, the viciousness of the conversation, the pain of the conversation, the anger, reached into communities, it even reached into families. Uh, the rabbis would each tell you stories of families who literally couldn't sit together for yontif meals because, and if they did, they couldn't talk about Israel. The family rule was you just can't talk about that because there was such, such anger at the table. And while there are many different positions on this, the argument fell 
roughly along generational lines, you make a very powerful statement that the purpose of Israel is not simply to ensure Jewish survival, but to ensure Jewish survival of a state that doggedly pursues justice, committedly pursues justice. But in our community, it would seem as if the community divides along generational lines. Older Jews see Israel as a place ensuring Jewish survival. Younger Jews see Israel as a place committed to a Jewish vision of justice. And that in certain moments, those two ideals contradict each other. And that's what makes the conversation so very bitter and so very difficult. So from where you sit, both in Israel and as a scholar we all love and respect, what do you say to us as families that might bring these two sides together? <laughs> Why'd you ask me that question? <laughs> many sides of you. I know you as a teacher. I know you as a lecturer. But I also know you as a mensch. And I know that one of the things, one of the reasons, whenever I hear you teach, whenever I hear you talk about things, you talk about it with humility. You have opinions. But you never speak with certainty. And that's what makes you so effective. Well, one of the things that makes you effective. But it's also one of the most essential and important lessons of life. The problem, you spoke about a generational conflict. Part of the problem is that each side was so certain. So certain. What was the only way to ensure Israel's survival? Or what was the only way for Israel to be just and righteous? When in fact, each position could argue that same argument. And that's what makes it frustrating, but part of the way in which a family heals itself, part of the way in which we learn to talk to each other and with each other about issues which we disagree about. And Iran is one example, but we've learned this in other issues, is we don't talk with such certainty. You can have an opinion. Who here is absolutely certain, absolutely certain, they know for certain that this deal that is the worst, that there could have been a better deal. Should there be a better deal? Maybe. Who knows here for certain that there could have been a better deal? I guarantee you nobody knows for certain. Who knows for certain whether this deal is worse or less worse in the next 10 years? when the other possibility was no deal. Now, I, just like everybody, and I'm not going to bore you with it, have my opinions. Part of the problem, it goes back to the perfect justice or to the perfect security. It's we become so arrogant. If you have an opinion, but you know it's an opinion, you know, it's one possibility. You can argue for it, but the level of hatred and viciousness which we, which we are experiencing, and it's not just about this, it's about every time Israel is on the table. And now it was Iran, and it could be a future ex, and it could be this president, is this president good or bad, or who's better, or what should we do? People are speaking with such a level of certainty. I, I find, that's what I find most alienating. And one of the things that we've learned, one of the beautiful things about the Jewish community, is that when we talk about our religion, we don't talk with such levels of certainty. 
And it's one of the reasons why so many people of other religious traditions feel we now have millions of people who are married into our community and who love coming to our community because there's a tolerance, there's, there's an acceptance of difference which is so inherent to our community. Like, okay, so I believe this, but you know, okay, you can believe there's room. There's so much air. There's so much room in our community. It's one of our greatest strengths here. It's how Orthodox, conservative, reform, reconstructionist, renewal, post-denominational, secular, <laughs> nuns, all live together. We do. There's tremendous room. But when it comes to Israel, there's no more air. We're all sucking up all the oxygen. We're sucking it up with our certainties. Where did you get to be so certain? Where, like, where did that come from? So, my, I would posit that it is a catastrophe. There's two catastrophes in our community for now, for this morning, in light of your question. The first catastrophe is the certainty with which we put forth our opinions in the midst of realities which are so complex, and if one thing is certain, that is that there is no certainty. The second tragedy is that the division is exactly along the lines that you mentioned. Why is it that attacking Iran is only a position, or being against the deal, is only a position motivated by security? Could be just as though equally motivated by justice. And a person who is for the deal could be just as motivated by security. But we allow each other you become the security camp, and I become the moral camp. That is a recipe for disaster. That's a recipe for such alienation for each other, and an unnecessary one. No side, whether you're for the deal or against the deal, whether you're left or the right wing, could ever afford to give up on either the legitimate rights of the Jewish people to live, and the obligation of the Jewish people to live according to justice and righteousness. Now articulate your argument from within those positions. And instead of being so torn apart, maybe there'll be some more room for each other at the table. I uh, hope that's uh, helpful. I have a lot of questions from the, uh, from the community here, so I'm going to sort of summarize some of these questions and, and bring them to you uh, one at a time. Um, there's a number of questions that basically uh, address your, your application of justice and righteousness to Israel's negotiation and relationship with Palestinians. And there's a lot of concern for how does one talk to an other who wants to annihilate you? And is there anything that you can say to the other which might, which might mitigate that desire to annihilate you, mitigate the hate, mitigate the complete rejection? No. <laughs> Unequivocally, no. Nothing. There's absolute evil, and this is something. St I started this many, many years ago. When I, I, when I started to hear lectures about what were the causes of anti-Semitism, deep down, I had an aesthetic revulsion of various explanations for what caused anti-Semitism. There's only one cause for anti-Semitism. And that is the human propensity for evil. It is not something that we did, and it's not some teaching that we put forth in the world. Nothing. Human beings are capable of evil. And people are only going to cease to be evil when they take responsibility for it. Palestinian society will change only to the extent that they take responsibility for the evil that they are allowing to grow, to fester, and to become stronger and stronger every single day. Every day. There is no excuse for evil. And by the way, and I'm not doing equivalency, I had this conversation with colleagues just the other day. I've been to war. I've killed people. I've seen people being killed. This notion that there is a moment where you lose your humanity 
is something that I reject. I reject it. I experienced a stabbing and therefore I could go stamp on somebody's head. And they have to be excused. They experienced something traumatic. No. I was there. I'm not speaking in theory. You could be angry. The act where you go and stamp on somebody's head to death is not the bypro is not the understandable consequence of an experience that you just had. It's a completely different move. It's a move in which there is a propensity and a possibility of evil in your soul and you let it out. You've let it out and you excuse it and therefore it's not by accident that these things usually happen in waves. Because when it is allowed, and it happens in waves, whether in Palestinian society and in a very different level in our society, but it's when it becomes culturally acceptable, when it's not defined as evil. Palestinian society has allowed murder of Jews and murder of Israelis to be portrayed and discussed and put forth in, in, in terms in which there is no moral censor of it. When a society gives to people who've murdered children hundreds of thousands of dollars, if the average Palestinian will make, if they're lucky, $500 a month, $1,000 a month, but if you know that if you kill an Israeli and a Jew, you will make five, ten times your family, you will be making sums of money which far exceed anything that you could have ever made in your lifetime. What have you said as a society? You have said that these acts aren't morally flawed and corrupt. Are there Jews who are morally corrupt? Yes. Up till now, with the exception of one small community, and I don't want to speak about them at large, because even there there's complexity. When a member of our community perpetrates evil, we call it evil. That's not trivial. That's not trivial. Now I can have a conversation. Are we doing enough? Why is it happening? It's evil. We both see it as evil and now we can have a conversation. But if you don't see it as evil, there's nothing that I could do to convince you otherwise. All I could do is protect myself. But I make a mistake if I believe that by protecting myself, I finished my obligation. I'm not going to change Palestinian society. They have to change themselves. But I do have to create an environment in which those changes are at least possible. That if they're going to do their work, that those who are willing to do that work have a chance for it to grow. If we do everything in our power to undermine it, while we're not responsible, we are complicit. And so I have, there's nothing that I could do to change Palestinian society. But there are things that I could do which will enable the changes that can take place in Palestinian society to grow. We do know, we do know, and this is not, again, this is not fantasy, we do know and again, I'm not saying whether Oslo was good or bad. We do know that there were periods in which Palestinian society or the majority of Palestinians chose a certain direction. We know that, if, that over the last 10 years, as any, any notion of a future uh, Palestinian state has been removed, regardless of who's responsible on the table, the community has increasingly rejected the possibility of two-state solution. We've seen those shifts. As Jews, we have to believe, and I do believe, that human nature can and is capable of choosing the good. And human nature is capable of choosing the good, not just Jews. Muslims, Palestinians are capable of choosing the good. They have to do their work. 
We have to obligate them. We have to call them for when they're not doing it. But I do believe that there are things that we could do. And that's where my politics comes in. And it's not relevant. And but frankly, the more right-wing you are, the more you have to do this. Because the more you want to hold on to Judea and Samaria forever, the more you have to ensure that, that the people who are living there feel respected and that their rights are respected for there to be some levels of coexistence. The greatest optimists of coexistence are the one statists, not the two statists. They're the greatest optimists that we could live together. There are things that we could do, but at the end of the day, one of the most important things that we could do is not take responsibility for their evil, because when we don't take, because it's, it's when you, when they will be responsible, and when they recognize them that as such, then maybe they'll begin to do something about it. You have a book coming out with the intriguing title, Putting God Second. It's, a, it's, it's so counter, uh, counterintuitive uh, that it comes from a rabbi. It's counterintuitive that it comes from an institute devoted to religious studies. It's a counterintuitive uh, idea. Um, in the community in North America, there is a reawakening interest in theology, so it's counterintuitive in that way. What does that book mean? The last line of the book is that if we put God second, we will put God's will first. That when we put God first, we are teaching a lesson antithetical to Judaism's teaching. It's a book about what happens to human beings when God enters into the room. Something distorted happens. I, I call it religion's autoimmune disease, in which it attacks itself. When God enters into the room, a moral blindness enters into the room which God, God self, doesn't want. God, in our tradition, doesn't fully understand God's impact on people. And that's why God gets all frustrated. In the, in the prophets, God said, what are you doing? Who are, why are you here coming to the temple offering? Who asked this of you? And what's the answer? Who asked of the Jews to come to offer sacrifices at the temple? You! <laughs> what does Isaiah chapter 2 say? Who asked this of you? You did! What, did you forget? What, the whole book of Leviticus somehow just <laughs> skipped your mind? Uh, whoops, I forgot. Oh, that's right, the book of Leviticus. Oops! Half of the 613 commandments of the Bible are centered on the temple. Oops, I forgot. I don't think monotheism fully understands. I think the monotheistic idea is potentially a poisonous idea because it creates a God who's too big. It's like nuclear, it's too big. And when God is too big, it makes human beings too small. When God's too big, it makes ethics secondary. God in monotheism, we have this transcendent one God, but when that enters in, human beings somehow believe that in the name of that God, they're allowed to do things that God, God's self, never imagined that they should be doing. And so it's, it's, it's a book about living with God by putting God second. That God could only be second because, and it's the, one of the center point moves of the book is quoting Hillel. When someone asks, teach me all of Torah, convert me on condition that you could teach me all of Torah while I stand on one foot. And Hillel says, what's hateful unto you, do not do unto others. That is the whole Torah. The rest is commentary. Go and study. Rashi flips out. 10th century, 10th century commentator says, whoa, what did Hillel forget? What's, what's not mentioned in what's hateful unto you, do not do unto others. That's the whole Torah. The rest is commentary. Go and study. Who's not mentioned? God. What are you talking about? Here it is. Hillel has to find it and he forgets God. And Rashi says, oh, this is what Hillel means. And I love Judaism because when someone says this is what it means, you know that's not what he meant. Right? <laughs> so, this is what he means. This is like, this is what Hillel means. What's hateful unto you, don't do unto others. 
Just like you don't like it when someone doesn't listen to you, so too God doesn't like it when you don't listen to God. So what's hateful unto you, don't do unto others, is don't do unto God. Don't treat God the way you wouldn't want to be treated, and therefore, what is Hillel telling people? Listen to whatever God wants of you. So he takes a little statement and makes it a declaration of fidelity and loyalty to God. But that's not what Hillel says. Because in our tradition, God, how do you walk in the way of God? By doing what is just and right. God is basically saying, you walk in my way by putting me second and putting ethics first. And so it's a book about the nature of this autoimmune disease in Judaism. Um, but it's not just Jew, it's I speak as a Jew, but it's the same autoimmune disease of Christianity and Islam. All of us suffer from it. Of how God creates moral blindness and how a religious tradition can feel itself so that it could walk with God, hopefully the way God intended for us to walk with God. So let's, let's pursue this for a moment. Um, because I'm interested in, in taking your ideas of justice and righteousness, in particular, your idea of God. There are chapters in the Torah. When I read them, I wonder whose Torah this is, because those chapters don't reflect my notion of justice and righteousness. There are chapters, many chapters in the Tanakh that truly don't represent my sense of justice and righteousness. And you and I have... So I think one of your favorite chapters is what, Deuteronomy 20, where we go to war, right? Our favorite hated chapter. Our favorite hated chapter. So, how, if knowing that your statement, which was very powerful, that this is the core integral principle of Jewish existence, justice and righteousness, then how do I read the rest of the Torah? And when I come across those chapters, what do I do with them? As Shakespeare says, the devil quotes scripture. <laughs> the devil doesn't misquote scripture. It's very important. Because part of our problem is what we do with our religious tradition. The second part that you're pushing on is that there's corruption in our tradition which doesn't seem to emanate from us, but it emanates from God, God's self. I have a whole chapter in the book on that. Um, and actually, I'd be very happy to come back when the book's available so that people can buy it. <laughs> um, uh, um, I just met with my publisher, and I have to do all these things. I'm not used to it. I've never done it. So, welcome to the world. They told me that every, every, every seven sentence they said I should just say something about it. the book, which will, you know. So it's one, two, three, four, five. And so I, 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 yeah, I have six more sentences until I mention the book. Um, one answer, which and one solution um, that could be offered, which I choose not to speak about in the book, is that it could be that scripture is written by imperfect human beings too. That's one way out. It's at least plausible. In the book, I choose another possibility. And I have a chapter about what happens to God when human beings enter into the room. And human beings, it's, it's, it's a com this is the hardest chapter in the book, which means sit down, it's going to take a minute. Human beings want a moment of revelation. We want a moment in which our doubts are answered. Religion markets itself as the solution to human uncertainty. You don't know? That's what you have religion for. There's an idea that I write about in the book, that was the seventh sentence. Um, <laughs> I was captain. Um, but I didn't speak about today, which comes from Genesis 18, where it's clear that ethics in Judaism aren't based on the Bible, but they're based on the human capacity to know the good. 
The first and primary source of that is Genesis 18. For if that's not true, under what foundation could Abraham turn to God and say, will the judge of the whole earth not deal justly? If God determines the good, on the basis of what does Abraham ask God, how could you deal, not deal justly? That means justice is not determined by God. The source of justice is not in Scripture. The source of justice comes from where? From us. That's, otherwise you can't understand how Abraham has the whole, the whole conversation is founded on that idea. Correct? Otherwise, otherwise, if God said, I'm about to destroy the city of stone, what should I say? Amen. Because you're what? You're God. Now, so this is central. We have a research fellow at the Institute who's explored and shown that for the vast majority of sources within our tradition, the notion that ethics is independent of revelation is the dominant position within, our, within the Jewish tradition. Dominant for over 2,000 years. And that the exceptions to that, are that those were, is, is truly the exception to the rule. But as I, sp I speak about this often, including to liberal audiences, people are very upset about that. They don't like that idea. Because the whole reason, I like, I, why do I want religion if it's supposed to, I want an answer. I want some certainty. Don't leave me to myself. Don't leave me to myself. That is the true salvation of religion. It's not the world to come. That's not bad. Not like if it really exists, it's a good thing. Because if it really exists and I'm not saved, that's bad. So if that's there, great. I'm all in. I love the world to come, messianic era, great. But the real salvation is the salvation from uncertainty. Is the notion that there's a holy scripture that gives me an answer. And I could pick and choose whatever part I want, but I ignore my picking and then I find the point and that just gives me the sense that it's not about me comes from, it's like, I answer, I'm like a hot dog. I answer to a higher authority. Uh, somehow, it's like there's something above me which just gives me objective, I want, human beings want objective moral truth. And very often, the more I live in a world in which there are none in my own life, I like that myth. So what, what happens is, is that human beings want that myth. That myth has given birth to the moment of revelation. And that moment of revelation could be in Judaism, it could be in Christianity, it could be in Islam. Every religious tradition has a moment of revelation. It could be a moment, it could be five years, it could be ten years. In our tradition, it's 40 years. The 40 years of the desert, because Torah is revealed, not at Mount Sinai, that's a mistake. It's revealed over 40 years in the desert. Just some stuff was at Mount Sinai. So there's this sacred moment, which we need in order to give us this objective truth. But the problem with any moment, and here it gets a little complicated, is that if any moment of revelation has to be limited to what the people at that time were capable of hearing. Perfect God cannot give a perfect Torah to an imperfect people. That the minute you need revelation, you place within tradition a core flaw. And that is the sanctification of the knowledge of one moment over others. The Torah is filled with moral flaws because human beings are filled with moral flaws. And some of the flaws of religion grow out of the fact that God just fries our brain. And we become God intoxicated instead of, and we see God instead of seeing other human beings. Look at Isaiah 58. God, we fasted. Why did you redeem us? Which is a classic Jewish statement. Like here it is. We fast one day and we think the Messiah should come. That's literally this, that's Jewish, that's the Jewish, 58, 2,500 years ago, the Jewish people turned to God and said, we fasted. 
We fasted for the whole day. The Messiah, a whole day we didn't eat. Like, what more do you want of us? That's literally what the Jewish people say in Isaiah 58. And God says, Hazet Zomech Harei, was this the day of fast that I wanted? God says, open up your gates. Open up your gates to the poor. Reach out to those in need, etc., etc. God intoxication makes us see only the vertical. The need for revelation sanctifies a particular moment of, of moral knowledge over another. And, um, and the moral failures of the Bible grow to the fact that as moral human beings we've advanced very significantly. We've only, there's things that we've learned today that we didn't know in the past. And so our challenge, and this is where it gets really complicated, our challenge is how do we read the Bible and take one chapter and ignore the other? And who's to say which chapter you take and which chapter you don't? Therein lies all the difference. And the rabbi who said, smash their brains, is quoting a chapter. And that's what makes it so difficult. They're not distorting the Bible. We are in the midst of a cultural war over the identity of our religion, which is no more than a cultural war over which chapter of the Bible is going to define who we are and which chapter we're going to relegate as some representation of past ethics. We do those choices all the time. But it is understanding that in doing those choices, we are making a decision as to what religion we're going to have. Now we look, for example, at Islam. And we say, failed. Like if you ever, if you ever engage with, Muslim, with Muslims in conversation, no, you didn't understand the chapter they say. You didn't understand. And we look at them and say, no, 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 no. You have to pick this or this. We have to do the same. The devil quotes scripture. Deuteronomy 20 is just one example. Leviticus 25, there's Genesis 22. I have chapters upon chapters upon chapters that I wish were never there. They reflect the ethics of antiquity. Thank God we've moved forward. Um, but which one we pick is going to make the difference as to what religious tradition we're going to have. One more? We have time for one more? Yeah. Um, I want to pursue one more question on this line. Um, I have sat in the Beit Midrash at the Hartman Institute for many, many years. And there is a procedure and a set of principles that govern the conversation. So you speak about a cultural war. But I've, and that's true, certainly. But within that one space, you have created a space for a certain kind of religious conversation, which is deeply passionate, often deeply adversarial, but deeply passionate and deeply tolerant and, de and open, including now open to Christians and Muslims who are part of the Institute's conversation. Take a moment, because this is critical for how we move forward as a religious community. How does one create, what, what are the principles of that environment in which a deeply passionate conversation can happen? but with a sense of commitment uh, to each other and, 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 and to God. It goes back to the first question you asked me. Um, I know nothing about Kabbalah. Like, I'm one of the few rabbis in the world who can't teach you anything about Kabbalah. I don't understand it tried, I've learned, my brain is not wired. It just doesn't connect. I don't understand. There's one principle, though, that I do understand. And it comes from the Lorianic principle called Tzimtzum. And I speak about it all the time because it's the only thing in Kabbalah that I understand. In Lorianic Kabbalah, they ask, how does the world exist if God is everywhere? If God is omnipresent, there should be no room for the world. And in Luriana Kabbalah, they come up with the answer that in the act of creation, God contracts God's self. That creation is not about God bursting forward. God's already there. 
It's about God contracting God's self to enable the world to exist. And it's a beautiful idea. God basically is, in, it's the seventh sentence in the last Shabbat, it's like God was putting God's self second so that the world could be. In many ways, the secret to our friendship and to the Torah that we teach and to the place at the Hartman Institute is you could come in with any ideology you have. You could be Orthodox, conservative, reform, we could, you could any de we could structure any denomination, secular. In the Hartman Institute, there is no definition of what does it mean to be an authentic Jew. But it doesn't mean that everybody comes in comes without an answer. You have your answer. But as long as you're willing to contract yourself to let somebody have a different answer, sit next to you. And not only can they sit next to you, but that you believe that you have something to learn from them. Because when you contract yourself and you let somebody into the room, they talk and you hear. There was once a rabbi who was given a grant to come to the Institute by his federation. And he was from the Orthodox denomination, on the right wing side of the denomination. And he said to me, I, you know, I'm very honored, I got this grant to come, I just wanted to ask you a question. And he said, um, I just wanted to know, um, are there going to be people teaching and in the room who don't believe that God wrote the Torah? And I said to him, yeah, there will be people who believe that God wrote the Torah, there will be people who believe that God didn't write the Torah, there will be people who believe, who don't even understand the question. <laughs> what does it mean God wrote the Torah? My father always used to say, I'll give you an answer when you explain to me the question. <laughs> so he said, thank you. The next day he called me again. And he said, are there going to, I just wanted to know, are there going to be people in the room who believe that halacha should change? And I said, yeah. <laughs> there'll be some people who believe that halacha should change, and there'll be some people who believe that halacha shouldn't change, and no one's going to tell you what to believe, but people will say what they believe. He said, thank you. The next day he called me, and he said, I wanted to speak to you about the definition of family at the Harvard Institute and, and the gay lesbian community. And I said to him, I think you shouldn't come. I said, you shouldn't come. Because in our Beit Midrash, you're going to sit with people who disagree with everything that you care about. And your job is to contract yourself so that you learn. Your job is not to worry about what someone else is thinking. It's just not your space. And so, whether it's at the Hartman Institute, whether it's about Iran, whether it's about the Palestinian conflict, whether it's about Israel, whatever it is, if we Jews could contract ourselves, but not contract ourselves into relativism, just contract ourselves to recognize that the world, that God contracted God's self to let the world exist, and our job is to contract ourselves to let the Jewish people as a community and to let other faiths coexist with us. It's, it's a mindset. But people very often confuse this with relativism. They confuse it as if anything goes. No, no. Anything truly goes in the context of the Institute. But everybody there has a serious position which they care about. And it's when different people stake a ground, stake a position, about that which they care. But know that when they do that, there's an other who they're responsible for, who they've contracted in order to make space for them. Then a, a, a new spirit of Torah emerges, a really a different spirit. And we rabbis who experience this together, we are very, very, and here I want to, I want to first of all, thank you rabbis for coming and cantors for coming. Um, Cantors come as well now. Uh, thank you for bringing your communities. You could do great service for your rabbis. Our community would be much healthier if the great debates that we have are done with the spirit of contracting. Just come a little smaller. Let your certainties be a little smaller. Before you shout at somebody, just be a little smaller. 
Your job is not to worry about somebody else. It's their job to worry about themselves. Your job is to make sure that they have room around the table. When we do that, then we create a beautiful conversation that Judaism is alive and Israel's alive. When we don't contract ourselves, our rabbis can't talk about Israel because anything they say is going to aggravate somebody who's taking up all this space and many rabbis are worried that they will have no more space in their shoes. They're going to be fired. <laughs> Literally. So we don't talk about it. When we don't talk about it, Israel dies. It dies amongst one generation and is definitely not passed down to the other. And so the biggest secret to the Hartman Institute's Torah and the one that, that, that I wish all of that we will have, regardless of what it is, what, what it is that we are arguing about and what it is that we're searching for, is that we do it with humility, that we do it um, with kindness, that we do it with sensitivity, and most importantly, we do it by contracting, contracting ourselves and allowing ideas and other people to breathe, um, allowing a world to come into existence. Rabbis, cantors, and teachers in the room have had the experience of sharing learning with you in Yerushalayim in Jerusalem, and the, the wonderful um, nourishment of that experience from the, from the teachers and from the community of the Institute. And we'd like to share our gratitude for bringing that spirit here to the Valley, and I urge all of you to take advantage of this remarkable opportunity to learn with the greatest teachers of Judaism in the world. Our next meeting will be in November with uh, Dr. Ruth Calderon. If you don't know who she is, Google her, find her inaugural speech to the Knesset that was made a few years ago, watch it, and then come and enjoy a remarkable, remarkable teacher of Torah. Thank you to the Hartman Institute staff for bringing this wonderful gift to us.